Okay. We can start it again here. On our second part of the uh, the discussion today on Arctic Chill, so let's focus on the novel here. <clears throat> Ended up talking about the uh, on some points just about how the context is relevant here, and right away the issue of ethnicity comes up. And of course, it's like right from the first page, it's marked out as something important about this novel. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what I want, what I was saying in part in response to the comments is that. Um, the, the novel is clearly trying to put ethnicity in the foreground and wants to talk about <clears throat> attitudes toward the changing of Icelandic society, right? I mean, it's a socially... We're back right in the sort of the wheelhouse of social criticism, right, where this is a novel that wants to take apart attitudes. And it, re it seems, you know, you could argue, or I would say, it gets a broad variety of attitudes um, toward... Um, the cha changing Iceland, you could say, the globalization of Iceland, the you know uh, multi uh, becoming a multi uh, Iceland's becoming a multicultural society, um, and wants to sort of give different people th the opportunity to to speak their mind and to put those discussions in conversation, um, and that that's part of its social criticism, one might argue. Um, so our job, in a way, is to try to unpack that a little bit and figure out. Um, some elements of it, and that's part of that ethical task that we talked about in the first part of the meeting, that you confront a society, there's clearly different attitudes probably than, than um, are a big part of American public debate, but maybe they are, maybe some of these attitudes, there's anti-immigrant attitudes, aren't that different than what we find, for example, in certain positions in American public debate that are, that say, build a fence, we need a fence along the border, or, or whatever it is, um, and uh, so we can see how another society deals with these issues is a very different society um, than ours. So, but that's the, but at the same time, right? We, I said, I mean, I think this is like uh, to come back to Bailey's initial point. This is kind of a historicist novel. It wants to talk about a specific debate, and it doesn't. It, it's not. It's not advocating for that. There's a certain response, or a, uh, there's a historical necessity that's going to carry the day. But it, it, it looks at it as a debate. It seems and uh, seeks to explore it. Um, and maybe is an intervention in, it, in its own way, trying to to, to uh, take part too. Um, you can make up your mind about that. Anyway, uh, Arctic Chill. I just noticed uh, the Icelandic title. Um, in this case, it's like the one novel of all the four, five we've read where the the Icelandic title and the English title are almost the same. So Arctic Chill and the Icelandic title loosely translated to be Winter City. So that's, I mean, we could think, you know, what's the, what's the difference between, I mean, Arctic Chill is a little more lyrical, I guess, and more sort of abstract. Winter City is maybe a little more dreary, <laughs> concrete. Um, but nevertheless, they both have that notion of season, cold. Uh, so any comparisons, Winter City, Arctic Chill, Gabrielle? Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where, like, it might not necessarily be about the weather, but, like, right. the people that live there. Absolutely. That's, that's clearly, well, you, you kind of beat me to the punch here, because what I was going to ask is what associations we might have. What, like, what, if we just start with the title, what does Arctic Chill mean? Or, and then if I, I've told you Winter, winter City um, as well. We don't know. I don't know if that's an idiom like the Seattle Freeze. I mean, it'd be interesting to... to write a novel, Seattle Freeze, right? You know, about a specific event, you could do it, right? Where there was some unseasonable weather event, right? We just, they just closed I-90 yesterday. Just don't call me, I guess, because it was so ha such heavy snow. Where you could figure out some kind of, like, actual event like that, you know, the snowstorm that knocked out Nichols or whatever, you know, and use that as a way to reflect on <coughs> these things. Actually, if you're interested in reading some interesting novels, a really interesting novel about Seattle, maybe a little before... When like you guys were like t 10, 12, there's an amazing novel by a, a novelist named Jonathan Rabin, R-A-B-A-N, called Wax Wings, about Seattle during the dot com bubble, and uh, it's it, if you want like a fun book to read over the, it's, it's just like amazing, amazing author. This is not crime fiction, but literary fiction. 
Um, a fun book to read over the break if you're looking for something outside your usual stuff. That's a good one, but it's it's kind of an interesting one. It's got ethnicity. It's got these things. That I think the protagonist is like some kind of dissolute professor from the UW or something like that. But it's not it's not an academic novel at all. But very much about. And it, I mean, he's he's getting rich too, right? He's got some kind of consulting thing he's going to do or whatever. But it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting perspective. Jonathan Rabin is a uh, a uh, um, English guy who is an expatriate, lives in Seattle here. Um, so uh, anyway, that's just an aside. The point was to go to what Gabrielle was saying about how Seattle Freeze is not just about the weather. So um, let's actually just start there. Um, two questions. What associations are there with this title? And then how is Arctic Chill thematized into the novel here? Um, let's just take it as a whole class here. Reflecting on um, how Arctic Chill, like actual events in which, in the plot or in the in the, in the story in which Arctic Chill is present, but then second, what associations are there with that title? What, is, what does the title mean, in other words? Anyone? Yeah. Right. So uh, let's see here. So Austin points out cold blooded killing. It's just uh um you know our metaphor for cold blood our metaphor for particularly grisly or amoral kind of killing to kill in cold blood um where the the, 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 the the temperature, right, in some ways is called to mind by the title of the novel. Yeah, good place to start. Other thoughts that come to mind just thinking about it? Yeah, uh, Kathleen. Mean, uh, they lost their okay, another one here. So, Airlander... Yeah, this is a, and actually this is one of the things that this uh, Indridison does is that many of the crimes in the novel are structured. There's like structural similarities between the crime and Erlender's own history, right? So that here we have the two brothers, right? And what happened to him? He and his brother were out on the moors or whatever the mountains in um, Iceland, way out in the nowhere, and the brother died in the blizzard, right, when Erlender let his hand go. So the two brothers, right, they're double, in a way it doubles for him. Um, one, another one, too, that, he, that keeps coming back is, and we see in this novel, what happens to um, Niram and, what happens to Niram most of the novel, right? He's a missing person. And so uh, this is another one, and then and there, there's a lot of reflection or Leonard does a lot of reflecting on missing persons, and the missing person is the Icelandic crime. And there's this woman who keeps calling him, who seems to be he is, he 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 links her in his mind to this domestic abuse situation that he has been part of another investigation, where and she's missing, right? She's run away or something like that. It turns out murdered or suicide, some kind of other. So this whole theme of the missing person is an important part of. Erlendo's personal history, as well as this story. Um, other things from the title, yeah. An isolated place, and also about isolated minorities. Okay, so um, Arctic Chill. Uh, how you see you're saying that's like isolation, and then we have um, isolation of minorities. In Iceland. So that figuratively, right, that the people who are, the people who are involved in the crime are all isolated by 
to weather in the same way that, you know, there's like an echo there of some kind. Yeah, great. Yeah, Austin. <coughs> okay, so we could just take like Icelandic and Thai differences. I mean, one that the, a thematize in the title, that's kind of, kind of thematization, right, where it, something in the title gets repeated in a way that signals to the reader that this is important to think about. Um, I mean, one thing to ask is, too, I mean, is that what the, is, it, is the title going for that equation? Where it's kind of an allegory, right? Where the title is trying to say, this is, a, this is Iceland, right? I mean, I think some of the things people have said have implied that, right? Where the, it, that's to read the title and argue that it's really trying to take this crime and talk about it as almost in an allegorical way where the, the characters are, represent certain types in Icelandic society. It's an, it's an argument, it's an analysis of um, uh, Iceland. Iceland, obviously. <laughs> is a version of Winter City or Arctic Chill, too. Ice Land. It's the same name in Iceland. Island. Other thoughts about the title? Yeah, Christine. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, well, you, if it comes back to mind, uh, share, share it with us. But, um, yeah, definitely, de there's a, you know, well, we, I think that Arctic Chill, it's not like an inviting title, right? It's like, ooh, um, very dreary title. That wasn't the right noise, I don't think. <laughs> dreary title, um, serious tone. You know, it's kind. Of, it's the, you can hardly call the title like sexy or something like that, right? It's like kind of foreboding, almost like almost uh, not inviting at all, right? Arctic chill, ugh, right? You kind of bundle up. Um, so it's. I mean, a title obviously sets. Many people choose the book you're going to read based on the title, right? And um, and so here we have an instance where that title is kind of. Mm, not that inviting. Um, the other thing is, too, it says, just as a subtitle, a Reykjavik thriller. Is this a thriller? I guess that was my last one, my a question I was going to work up to later. But it's not a thriller at all, really, is it? I mean, there's not really, it's a more, it's a, it's, there's, it's a police procedural, and there's almost like a whodunit aspect to it, where there's very limited kind of, I mean, they, they don't have any real ideas of the suspects, but it's kind of a, it, it, that small Icelandic sort of social scope makes it seem like they know the suspects. Maybe a little bit of whodunit. Anyway, okay. Um, already in the discussion, so these are, these are some things that, that, that I think the, the point about, uh, um, th these points all in some ways resonate. Um, Arctic chill, isolation, cultural differences in the title, winter city, Iceland as a country, Cold-blooded killing, all these things, the serious tone. Um, all of the signal to us that the the issues in the novel have to do with the set, very strongly with the setting, and Iceland. So, in a way, this is a novel that wants to talk about um, Icelandic society, and Icelandic society, in some ways, is emblematic of of struggles over, in particular, locality and cultural difference that are familiar from other parts of the world. Um, so let's take a look at that. People already mentioned in, 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 in talking about context here what matters, um, ethnicity, nationality. Um, and actually, in, I'm going to give you, I'll just choose a passage here and ask you to talk about it. And the passage is this one. For this is from the, page four, from the very beginning of the investigation. 
Um, and what I'd like you to ask, what I'd like to ask is, what are you, what are the issues around ethnicity here? Just trying to talk about. I just unpack this. What issues are here in this novel? If you think of this as the first, where they they identify this victim as a child, um, right? Who he looks Asian to me. One of them say so. Just I want you to like read this and think about what the issues are that that are part of this. So where do you think he's from? This Sigurd or Oli wondered, um, the young kind of more American more Americanized cop. He looks Asian to me. Ellen Borg says this is the uh, the woman officer. Could be Thai, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, Chinese. Sigurd or Oli battled off. Should we say that he's an um, he's an Icelander until we find out otherwise? Airlander said. So what I'd like you to do is make a list of two or three things that are issues around ethnicity here. That could be like how ethnicity is being understood or how nationality is resonating here. What are the things that we need to pay attention to based on what we find in this passage? So in a way you're making an agenda for how we can deal with issues of ethnicity, nationality, race um, in the novel based on uh, this passage, which is where it really for first gets introduced in the novel. So let's take a couple minutes to do that with people sitting next to you, and then we'll talk about it as a class. Yeah. 
Um, I, I don't know the specifics. I, I'm guessing that it's the same as the other scanning countries where if you are born to, I mean, the rules are usually that, well, I was talking about so someone, Susan was asking, uh, before we start, um, the, uh, uh, what is, so what are the rules, like how, do you, how, how are you an Icelander, not an Icelander? That, um, it, in the other Scandinavian countries, if you're born to p two people who are citizens, and um, you're born in the country, you're automatic, automatically counted as a citizen. Um, so there's not the policy, like for example, people may know that in Germany for years, people could be permanent residents, Turkish people could be, there are many Turkish people who, we're like second, third generation living in Germany, total, totally German in many ways, and yet they were not German citizens because their parents were Turkish. Um, and so in, in Scandinavia, those, those laws have been changed in many ways so that if you're born to people who are themselves citizens, you become a citizen, right? Um, there's not these sorts of long-term permanent residents who aren't actually citizens. But um, if you're born to a person who is a where the mother is Icelandic and the father is is Finnish or Icelandic or whatever, you you're automatically if your mother is that that the, the a national citizen, you're automatically granted um, citizenship. But if the father is, then there's a, like a more complicated process, but it's granted nevertheless. But for example, if you were born in Iceland, just like if you living in Iceland, you're born and like you are living in Iceland, you have a child or your partner has a child, and um, that's it, that, that child is not an Icelandic citizen, right? You don't get national. That's the way it works in the United States, right? Um, so it's it's an ethnic categorization of citizenship, not a political one like we have in the United States. So that's a big difference between ice, the Scandinavian countries and um, the U.S. So that, as I mentioned before, that's like, for example, in Denmark, that's been one of the, these really contentious issues about citizenship. So here we have, when they say an Icelander, it's an ethnic identity, not a citizenship definition. But what did you come up with in thinking about this passage? Uh, Hannah. Uh, we just like learning how we kind of list off all the different like uh, Okay, so if I understand you right, you're saying that they're, I mean, of course, they're like, this is the, it's like the crime scene, or, but, but, um, that, that kind of listing is superficial? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Casey, you had your hand up? Okay. Right. <laughs> So there's a big jump that goes on, right, where there's sort of the appearance of different leads to immediate 
differentiation. And, you know, kind of there's this, at the end, right, this kind of correction. Well, that's not a fair... It, 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 the assumptions are clear, in other words. Assumptions being made. Um, Kaya? Uh huh. Okay, so that it's not only that there's assumptions, but there's a kind of an, almost like an objectification. You know, I mean, that, that, I was talking to Shuandra, um, you know, and. To where and she was pointing out that like the there's a category there's almost like an attempt to categorize Thai Filipino Vietnamese Korean Japanese you know and when you categorize right you objectify and so despite the the sense of um, uh, that is you put it, put someone in a classificatory scheme and under that understand them as representation of the of the scheme rather than as an individual um, and so in a way then you could say that I mean that's the kind of I'm not saying that he's like objectifying a kid so much as the logic, right, does that. Bailey? Also, like, that all of the sentences aren't all, Asians kind of really broad, and they're Asian. Yeah. Right, so it's this, there's like an aspect of point of view where Asian is just Icelander, right? I mean, to the Icelander, it's just Asian, and then the Sigurdi, he tries to like go a step further and say, actually, I know about a little bit about Asia, and then sort of list out what countries he knows in Asia, right? But in a way, it's almost a bigger sort of misstep on his part because he shows, in a way, how little he knows, right? Um, it's almost like, you know, those kinds of things where... That the, the term that's kind of dropped out of American usage, which is like Oriental, right? But if you read about, like, watch Charlie Chan movie or something like that, see those kinds of things, where it's this real sort of like othering of the, the, the uh, you know, and of course that is part of that part of we don't see it so much in this novel, maybe, but the uh, an old sort of trope of Asia, right? The the mysterious Oriental. We can't understand those people, right? We can't understand their language. This is sort of like the American point of view, where. What one of the things that we see here is like that very strong point of view come come out, where the position of the person doing the categorizing stands. Um, Gabrielle, you've had your hand up for a while. Right. I mean, it, we talked a little bit about this but in, when we talk about ethnicity, that actually I mean, people have really rejected the notion of bio, or the scientists, right, have rejected, especially with the genome research, have rejected or heavily, heavily qualified the notion of biological race because no matter where you're from, it's like 99.9% .9 the same. Um, so the notion of biological race is really kind of bit taken a drubbing, but that doesn't mean that it's not like heavily marked notions of ethnicity and differentiation. One of the things that we see here on your comment, right, is a, pro, a kind of a slippage, right, where biological race is invoked, and then that kind of stands for ethnicity, where if, if we know some kind of idea of biological race, that's enough to figure things out when it's really talking about something else. So, or the issues maybe elsewhere. So there's kind of like a confusion that's caused by the comments. Agnes? Uh huh. A police conversation. So we would, you know, we would kind of expect them to be a bit more non-emotion related, not putting so much like emotion into their like part of the conversation. Excellent, excellent point. Yeah, think about you know Seattle Police Department right now, like in a. Federal, federal uh, Department of Justice investigation and, 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 and sort of attempts to deal with violence by the Seattle Police Force because of uh, findings that, uh, that there have been, you, you know, pattern of the use of violence against 
ethnic minorities and so forth, right? Where the way police officers talk can impact the kinds of actions they take. And if they're talking like this, I mean, whatever you think about it, does that, might that cause them to act in a way that would have, differentiate between people, for example? So, I mean, this is, I mean, in the same way we recognize the way journalists talk about crimes, for example, where, where the way that a suspect is identified or when a victim is identified. So this is an, another issue to think about where we have that kind of comparison. Other points? Yeah, Austin. But even though they are criminals, what they say is they're kind of making, are they uh, like secret Yeah. Uh, Right. It's, I mean, it's like a, it's sort of a, a uh, um, there's a dialogue here, right, where there's different perspectives that are being introduced. Sigurola, right, he kind of puts his foot in it, but the, I mean, in a sense, like from from our perspective, and at the same time, he's like making the effort to say, you know, I'm not trying to just paint with a broad brush stroke here, but I recognize the implication of my comment, and then Erlen, of course, is trying to correct him at the same time and say, hey, don't make those assumptions at all. So we have some different perspectives here, and that's one of the things that, that's maybe an important point of the novel to take away from here, is that there's a lot of different perspectives that are put into conversation. Susan, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, I think one thing we're missing about context, I'm going to be a devil's advocate here. When you're a homicide vector and you come on a dead child at a scene of the crime, the single first and most important thing to do is identify the victim. Okay. Because that gets you closest to finding out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you don't, it isn't unusual at a crime scene, at a discovery of a body, for the cops to sit around and talk about who do we think the victim is, where mm -hmm. are our investigative leads taking us. Now, three citizens had just come across the body mm -hmm. and had this conversation. I think you could say, depending on what the purpose of the conversation was, of the people talking, you can, it has a little bit of a different read. I mean, I yeah. don't disagree with what's being said, but right. in the context of a, an immediate death, and a homicide investigation, identifying the victim is really critical. And um, and that includes all parts of, you know, right. observations. Well, they excellent, make. excellent point, or sort of challenge to the way we, we, we've been doing the analysis. That anyone ever called 911, right, when you're reporting some crime, they ask you racial questions, right? What's the race of the, of the, of the, of the person? You know, because they're trying, they're doing the, the quick and dirty to try to identify what's going or the victim or whatever. Um, I mean, among other questions, what's the build, what's the height, what's the whatever. Um, and so uh, here we're in a similar kind of moment, right, where they're asking these things because they're trying to get, they're working as quickly as possible to identify things. And in a so society that is probably a lot more, hom well, it is a lot more homogeneous than ours, this could be an important way of identifying the person. Right. So other, other points. Um, let's take a look at another passage here. I just thought, since this is the, uh, the the question, and what I what I'd like to do is 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 just from this conversation is take away like some points, some further questions, um, and so uh, that is like what's going on with ethnicity here. That's what the novel wants to talk about in in many ways. Um, so what what are the questions we need to ask? That's what I'd like you to to, to, to sort of talk about. What questions do we need to ask this novel? about the way that ethnicity is being depicted. And so let's turn to another, a little bit later example where Erlender is speaking with Elias' grandmother, right? So she's an ethnic Icelander um, as well, Sig Reader. And um, they're talking about, like, he's trying to figure out, are there things in the family or are there, what, what might be the potential motives for the murder of this Elias? And um, so this is her reply to him. You can look on page 53 if you want more. Um, info. But what I'd like to do is take a look at this passage and ask you to know, first talk about first what's going on here. Same question. Um, but instead of making arguments about what's going on, let's just ask what questions do we need to figure or let's try to, to figure out what questions do we need to ask about ethnicity in this novel. Okay? So talk about that for a few minutes and we'll talk about it as a class.
right? Because the, his Aaron Lander, if you remember, remember from the novel, Aaron Lander's line of questioning here is if the brother might be the killer. Okay, let's uh, let's let's turn back to the class here. And um, the question was then, uh, as much as w I mean, a little bit what's going on here, but but more than that, what what questions do we need to ask the novel about ethnicity? Yeah, Charlie. Right. So, I mean, is there a difference here being drawn? Would you ask the same question in an Icelandic family? Was the brother the killer? So maybe that's that's one thing that is just to try to draw some comparisons or look at the way comparisons are made. Because, of course, that's, in some ways, it's a point of view, right? Like, the place where you're asking the question from shapes the kind of question you might ask. And if you're the one in sort of control or in power, oh, is there something over different among those people? Those people, right? That I don't understand. That leads to that kind of this sort of quest line of questioning. Good start. Any other thoughts or questions that people want, think we would need to raise? Tracy. <laughs> I don't know the answer to the question. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a, uh, I can say that, I, I mean, like the places I have lived in, in the Nordic countries and, you know, following the media, um, it's a different kind of conversation we have here. And I think in part, you know, as I mean, we, I don't know, I, people could, I don't know what your views are of American society, but one of the things that you, I think you probably can say about American society is that we have this horribly ugly, you know, history of racism and, and, and institutionalized racism, slavery and so forth, that in a way you could say, I mean, people say, like, that's the big story in the United States, race, right? That we don't, we don't talk about it. It's like our repressed. We try to avoid it, whatever, and it's always there. Um, and we can all think of the way that that's a part of the fabric of American life. Um, but because it's so present in a way, we're, we've ha we, we can all, we're also aware of it, and we can talk about it, and we can deal with it in, our way, in, in different ways, in different contexts, and everyone kind of knows about it, right? Um, that it has these particular perspectives and conversations and paths that they can, they can pull up. Um, they don't have that so much here. And so I f my experience, I always feel like it's very naive in a way like the things I hear. For example, I remember in Finland, 
there was, you know, there's a big uh, uh, Somali population there. And there was some sort of, like, fighting in some school in or, or just outside Helsinki where there was, like, violence along race lines, right? And so they, the big, the tabloid there, they had these pictures of, you know, faces kind of, like, digitally blanked out so you couldn't see the faces. But it's, like, some clearly, like, ethnically white Finnish kid like this, you know, and then, like, some Somali kid like that. You know, you put a picture like that on the newspaper, you don't need to write anything, right? It's like this clear, like, attempt to use race to tell the story. Um, and as it turned out, if you, like, that particular incident, the Somalis weren't the attackers, right? They were actually the victims, right? Of course, you put in the bigger context, these people who've come to this, it's like they've come to the Arctic chill, right? I mean, it's a, but, but you know, so I, I think one of the things that, that, you, that, that you see is a little bit of maybe, the, race, the, the kind of racism, racial tension might in some ways get stoked by the way the stories get told. And um, um, so that's why maybe in, in a way it's also important to think about the way the story gets told here and pay attention to it. Of course, that's really, you know, that's the point. Like, you may ask yourself, what do you get from a novel like this? But it, it's an opportunity to think about how the story gets told and notice the, the ways in which it tries to deal with issues of an ethnicity or race and um, make you think about it, and maybe we would have different ones, or we we, look, we see what we wouldn't do um, here as much as what we may think is uh, um, helpful. But uh, yeah, so I think that I guess my response to you is I don't know the answer about the ice for particular Icelandic thing, but you can say that there's these strong anti-immigrant parties that are trying to make get win votes and get political power by campaigning in overtly racist ways or covertly racist ways, um, and that has been a big part of public conversation there for the last 20, 20 years, and particularly the last 10. So um, that's a part of, part of Iceland, Iceland, Iceland discussion, too. Other things, questions we need to ask. Uh, case is a good one, though. Like, what, what's really going on there? I would, you could always look at the media and find out reporting, too. Other things. Um, we're kind of coming to the end here. I was, uh, there's some other questions I have, but we can, in some ways, put them off a little bit. But let me just leave them with you so you can think about them as you're reading. Um, you know, I mean, what, another way to, to think about this one would be, like, what are the points of view on ethnicity in this novel? To try to, like, gain out a little bit what the different perspectives are and, and what differentiates them. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Second one, to tur turn transition to a little bit different set of questions is that once again we have this child victim or a child involved um, in the crime and that's something we've talked a lot about um, so far so one thing to do would be to kind of compare and contrast the way in which the child is depicted here in this novel with other novels we've read uh, so far um, clearly then we have these characters for Thursday we'll talk about the anti-hero Airlander is clearly an anti-hero, right? He's got a personal life is in a shambles for the most part. Um, strained relations to his, to his um, daughter, collapsed marriage from 20 years ago he's never really dealt with, personal traumas, um, addiction in the family, and so forth. Um, so his character is an interesting one, and then we have these other interesting characters as well. Um, the family, right? Uh, Sunni, Niram, Elias, Odin, the divorced husband. And then um, the other cops, right, are present as well, and interesting in their way. And then finally, it's like a police procedure that we mentioned already. So what? Is there comparisons on contrast we can make to other novels um, so far? So think about that genre, the child, character, as you read, and we can pick up on some of those um, issues on Thursday. But for now, I'll say so long.